minds. <laughs> Welcome back. It's good to be back. Hey, uh, like, what was it, two and a half, almost three weeks ago, I pull out of here in my Xterra. Actually, I went out to start it. It was one of those really cold mornings, and it made a weird noise, and then on the drive home would not go past 30 miles an hour. You know, RPMs and everything looked good. Anyway, my, my whole timing system had cracked no and blown up out here, and the, uh, God is good. I was able to drive across town, and thanks to Ernie and the gang at Bears Repair, uh, got got it back. Took a while to get all the parts and things, but uh, so I drove it into the parking lot, and I'm like, wow, it was like three weeks ago is the last time I had this vehicle out here. So I'm hoping when I leave today that it's a little smoother exit. Mr. Bodwell, how's your vehicle? Uh, my vehicle, thankfully, is, is running very well. I'm uh, till he leaves. I'm actually well, no, no. I'm actually leaving to get tires because one of the people I, I work with pointed out that two of my tires are very bald, and that that I learned that can be dangerous. So I'm I'm getting tires when I leave here. That's a smart move. Yes, I try to be a smart guy. Nothing like some good skins back on the vehicle, baby. Mm -hmm. Good tire makes a good difference. Thankfully, I have smartness with my lack of punctuality. <laughs> I know one thing. If I ever need to hail a bus, this is the guy I'm getting in the car with. It's good to have traits that offset each other. You know, that's I, <laughs> I was telling one of my friends yesterday, when I, uh, when I finally pass away, I want the funeral to start at 1, and then I want them to wheel my body in about 110. <laughs> that seems like it would be about right. <laughs> I just yeah. figured they would have a bus leading the procession. <laughs> Definitely would be a bus, a series of buses that would stop right in front of you know, When my, my grandmother passed away in 1990, she was 94 at the time, came here from Sicily when she was uh, 24. And uh, when she died, I think the funeral procession was a, at least 100 cars long, maybe wow. even longer, because mm. uh, people came in from Canada and Italy and all parts of the country. It was uh, really, it was the longest funeral procession I've ever been involved in. It's the only funeral procession I've ever been involved in where someone got so impatient with how long it was that they actually cut in on the, it was somebody with Virginia plates too, <laughs> uh, which of course would be the situation. Uh, somebody cut in on the funeral procession and I thought that's a really, uh, uh, not only is it a rude move, but it's a gutty move. It's a really gutsy move yeah. in this particular case. Well, I felt extremely bad. Um, we had a, a lady at, at the church that, that my wife and I attended who had passed, and we were there for the funeral. But I had to come back to the radio station and could not go to the graveside service. But ultimately, I'm in the mix of all the cars, so I'm driving through downtown Martinsburg with my flashers on, and we get to Moeller Avenue, and the rest of the procession takes that right, and I quickly turn my flashers off and shoot straight through the intersection. <laughs> and some of the looks you got from people sitting at that intersection, I'm like, look, I was at the funeral. I really, I really was. was. I did not just jump the line here. That does seem like <laughs> something that you could do, though. Like Something like Larry David would do on Curb Your Enthusiasm, by the way. That is actually a really good idea. I'm gonna I'm gonna add that to the repertoire. Just breeze in with the flashers and then cut right back out. Uh, this guy over here has uh, officiated uh, probably two more too many of those uh, types of services. Bill Kearns, he's uh, with the Berkeley County Health Department, the man in charge, and also is a minister. Billy, welcome. Good morning. Yeah, it's great to great to be here this morning. I, I feel different sitting on this side of the table because, <laughs> as Matt said, you got the big the adult chairs over here you're not sitting in the little chairs so yeah we're not always uh, we're not all as tall as john here so you, know, you, 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 you can sit on the floor and look like you're sitting on a chair <laughs> he's so. sitting on the floor right now. <laughs> when he wasn't here on time we pulled his chair out yeah we yeah. can tell when the admiral's sitting there because it's a little yes. bit lower so. <laughs> uh now when you go back long enough in the studio bill that you remember when we had the one camera and it sat here nobody, i remember when nobody, we were down in the dungeon oh well, yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. yes uh, but nobody wanted to sit in that chair, remember? No, that was this is Jason Barrett's chair. What we call it? <laughs> the fat chair. The fat chair. <laughs> because the, since the camera was right on you, mm -hmm. no matter what your figure was. Now there's was, cameras everywhere. Now they're all over the place, yeah. But everybody who sat here looked like they were huge because it was the first thing the camera saw. Right. So, the, so the camera was, was basically a giant close-up on you, and it would blow you up to make you fill the screen. 
Well, sometimes the camera wasn't lying when it was looking at me, so, yeah. <laughs> Not as far as you know. <laughs> yeah, Not as far exactly. as you know, right? Uh, so uh, you recently made a trip to Charleston to try to talk to a few people about uh, harm reduction and some other health department-generated issues. Yeah, um, last week it was Public Health Day at the legislature, and we go down each year um, to in February to be able to speak with our, our lawmakers, and it's always a great time to go down. Um, well, we can, they'll take the time out of their schedule to, to meet with us. And this year it was absolutely incredible the amount of people from health departments across the state. We had over half of our boards of health represented this year in Charleston um, to be able to speak on a number of different issues. Um, certainly one of those was harm reduction. We have a, a bill that was uh, introduced and not the first year for it, um, but certainly is um, uh, uh, something that could cause uh, detrimental um, effects to our harm reduction programs, and that was to, to basically eliminate the syringe access portion of harm reduction programs. Um, and, and that, in a sense, in some counties, or if you're, if you're not doing the program correctly, that could be a danger. Um, and some I, apparently aren't. Some apparently aren't. In Berkeley County, um, that is the um, the basically the attractant to get someone to come into our program um, that's in need. We're we're providing the the clean syringes. It's it's not it's not something that we're trying to get people hooked. They're already that way. They're just wanting to come into our program. We get them clean syringes. That way, they're not sharing them. That's going to cut down on the chance of um, spreading disease such as HIV, hepatitis. We're providing them the clean syringes, but we're making them responsible. They have to bring the dirty ones back to get more clean ones. And some of them come into our program every week. Some of them come in once a month, every two months. But we're making them responsible. So in Berkeley, Morgan County, we have a 97 to 100 percent return rate on those syringes. But that doesn't stop there. They come in, they can get vaccinated. They can come into the programs and they can get tested for any sexually transmitted diseases. They come into our program and through the hard work of our, our, our program um, um, workers, we've gotten people into programs gotten them clean they've gotten their lives reestablished they're living back with their families they're getting jobs that's a success story of our program but if it wasn't for for the most part for those that syringe access portion of the program they would never come through our door we had delegate gino chirelli on last week and he talked about the issues in morgantown with uh, syringes strewn throughout the community uh, a 10 to 1 distribution of uh, clean needles to uh, a dirty needle. Uh, he mentioned that he went in and, and just to test the program out himself, was able to get bags of needles without exchanging any other type of needle. And as a result, his experience with the program is quite negative. He's looking for much tighter restrictions on the program, Bill. Did you happen to catch that interview? I did not. But, there, you know, there, there, I'm not saying that there's not going to be dirty syringes you're going to find in the community. But our program is set up so tightly that while we do a program here in the health department in Berkeley County and we do one in Morgan County, we also do one, we have an outreach clinic that we go out to the people to take supplies to them, but we have to buy our syringes from multiple suppliers because we know which ones come from which supplier, so we know what color caps they are um, and things and what labels are on them. So we're able to track which ones. Now, our people bring them into us, um, but we know we know where that whether they're the syringes that we actually provided or ones that they're getting from home or other places. So, Bill, let me ask then, to hear what's going on in the Morgantown area compared to what is going on here, who sets the standard for how the program should be run? Is it a case where in Morgantown they're perhaps not following the guidelines that say it should be an exchange, you bring the dirty one to get the clean one? Or is this just how you guys have decided to run it here in our area? Well, it's... it's it is a little bit of both. There are program guidelines that set forth. We have to be permitted by the Office Facility Licensure and Certification out of Charleston. So we have to submit policy and procedures on how we're going to run our program. We just can't do it however we want to. 
Um, we have guidelines we submit to them, the number of different policies that, that began in the inception of our program that we had to submit. So, yeah, um, you could look at some programs that said, you know, we'll give you a, a 10 syringes, and, well, if you only bring us one or two back, we'll give you another 10. Well, that's, that's 80 to 90% of the syringes that did not get returned. Um, we're looking at, you bring us back 10, we'll give you 10. Um, so we're looking, if, and, and by the way, we, we, when they bring them back, we're not counting them. We have the containers that they bring them in, and we know how much they, they weigh. So we can kind of average how much a syringe weighs. So they, they're able to, to do it like that. They're not opening the, the sealed containers just to count how many needles are in there. We're actually weighing them. So we do have a lot of good protocols in place. Our, um, our, our program coordinator, Katie Morgan, was on uh, probably a couple weeks ago with me. And um, she runs a really tight ship. So I'm really proud of what she does within the program within Berkeley and Morgan County. So what happens when someone comes back and... You know, they're looking for another 10, but you're weighing it out and going, you only brought me back about six needles here. Uh, it, do they then get six in that case? How, how well, they, they do come. We don't separate the needles from the packs that they come in. Okay. Um, so they do come in a pack of 10. Right. But if they're only bringing it back two, you're not going to get any. If you're going to bring us back six or seven, yeah, you'll get a pack of 10. Okay. John? And, and then some people do bring back more than what they've received as well. I mean, I think that's uh, I think it's great on both ends for the community. I mean, we're we're helping the public health for the people who are suffering um, from the disease, and we're also helping to keep needles off the streets, which is beautiful. The question I have is: Are you seeing it get bigger or smaller? Is the problem getting worse? Is the problem getting a little better? Um, that's a good question. I I would say we're probably. I'm not going to say we're extremely better. But we're better than what we were when we started um, uh, a large number of years ago. So what we're seeing is a large number of people that we are seeing could potentially have been um, sharing diseases, and that's not happening. Um, so, but there still are times when we're going to see a high spike of overdoses within our county. Um, the different programs that's in place that we do, that WVU does, um, provides Narcan to people education. We provide a, uh, we have a grant that's, that's written that provides for a quick response team that if there's an overdose, you're going to see a member of that quick response team maybe show up on your doorstep the next day saying, how can we help you? Um, so we have different protocols that's in place that's making it better. But the amount of people that are still using, as I'm not saying that's any better. I did, um, I did some work a few years back. I wrote a few grants in the, um, in the drug uh, assistance, trying to assist people with, uh, with drug problems. I actually went down to Huntington, and I toured their quick response team, which I guess was one of the original ones, them in Coleraine, Ohio. And it was amazing. I went out, I went out for, a, for a day and a half with Huntington's quick response team and watched the good and watched, uh, watched some of the areas they went into. Are you seeing, I mean, do you guys, I mean, do you guys go out? I mean, I know we have a few homeless communities in the area, and I know there's a high incidence of, of drug addiction in those communities and also high incidence of, of disease. Do you guys, when you're saying outreach, are those the types of places that you guys go out to? Yes. Um, we're, we're finding people, places within the community. Now, we just can't rotate. We actually have to pick a location that we go to for our outreach, and then has to be permitted by OFLAC. Okay. So, what is OFLAC? Though? It's Office of Facility Licensure and Certification. Um, they they permit a lot of different agencies, long term care, and some healthcare um, places. So we just can't go out a different place every week. We have to have it identified, the location, the hours, and the, and the days that we're going out there, so that they permit us for that site. Um, but we, when we, they picked the site, it was one that has a lot of high drug usage area. So we're going out there. And then sometimes our workers are just going out, um, not days, mornings like today when it's real cold, but they'll just go out on days just to go and, and clean up litter and syringes in those areas um, to make sure it's a safer place. The playgrounds aren't loaded with um, needles on the ground where our kids can get in contact with them. Um, the programs we do are good. And right, they're well structured, as you mentioned at Huntington. We are just building on those programs that you, what you saw. Do you um, do you see? Again, getting back to a previous question, do you see more when you go out to these um, the homeless communities, especially in the area? Are you seeing them getting smaller or larger? 
um, or are you seeing? Is there is there more need there? Is there more is there more addiction in the homeless community than there was say two three years ago? I, I think they're getting larger. <clears throat> the areas are more they're more um, number higher numbers of people in those small areas. Um, so when we go out there, and, and by the way, we're not just going out to provide syringes or check we have a clinician that goes out that actually does some primary care um, we also provide food to the people that are out there we provide clothing gloves um, socks um, number of different things we take water um, we take out there with us Do you coordinate the with the mission on those things bill um, we don't we have people that donate to the um, the harm reduction program and our and our quick response team people um, so those are the items that we take out and some of the things are are purchased by our own staff just to be able to take out um, things that they, that that they don't need necessarily to be heated up it's just ready to eat type of foods that you could take out with them and um, so we provide a number of different services and that was just one of the many things that we talked about while we were in Charleston mm -hmm. um, one of the other big items was uh, immunizations each year um, in Charleston, we come under attack. And there's no other way to, to phrase that. We come under attack for what we, as West Virginia, are doing the best at. And I can't say that enough. We're doing the best at providing immunizations, mandatory immunizations for our children. Lots of states want to tailor their programs after what West Virginia does, which is not normal for us to be able to say we're, we're number one at this. But we are, and we, we provide mandatory immunizations for school-age children before they go to school, before they have that first day in kindergarten. We provide immunizations opportunities for as soon as a child is born. My grandson was born a little over a month ago, and the first day he was in the hospital born, he received his first immunizations for hepatitis B. And then at two months of age, you get the second one. Six months, you get the third one. But we are giving vaccines to children who are in our schools. Now, if you homeschool your child, there's no mandatory requirement for that. But are you taking your children out in the community um, to see other children? We struggle with our area. We know we have a lot of people that are coming to live in our area here in the Eastern Panhandle that may come from other countries where, or other states where vaccines were not required. And what we're trying to do is protect what we have in place right now. There's a lot of vaccines that are not required, but there are a good many that are, such as um, um, DTaP, which is uh, diphtheria, tetanus, poli or we do polio, pertussis, um, we do um, MMR which is the measles, mumps, and rubella. We have, is far, even in Washington County, where we have a case of measles, we will see more and more of cases of these diseases that we have eradicated come back if we are not careful of what we're doing with our vaccines. Lots of vaccines, people get confused, at, you know, such as um, um, uh, HPV, which protects you from cervical cancer, vaccines such as that, um, hepatitis A, that that people think are required. They're not. They're great vaccines to have. There's a lot of thought process went into them. They are fully licensed and they're great to provide. But there are certain ones that are required to get into school, and that's what we go out to protect. So, Bill, if uh, when I was a kid, I had all my vaccines uh, when, as they were developed. I was born in 63, so some of these kind of came along as I was getting along in school age. I have the, the scar on my shoulder that kids today don't have to deal with any longer. But uh, what was that for, by the way? Smallpox. Smallpox, okay. And um, uh, so, you don't have to deal with it because we've eradicated it. But in some yes. countries, smallpox is still very real. Right. So uh, if I'm vaccinated... Uh, odds are I can't get these diseases, correct? Way less chance. Way less Way chance. Way less chance. Right. So if I'm vaccinated, why do I care if Matt's not vaccinated for measles, mumps, rubella, polio, or whatever, if I'm vaccinated and it's fairly certain that I won't get these diseases? Because there is still a small chance, minute, but a small chance that you could come in contact with it. Larger chance, we'll give an example, the ever-popular uh, flu vaccine. Matt didn't get it. You got it. Matt comes in here and he's sneezing, coughing, 
something like you, you have been doing since. Darn it, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> um, and he has influenza. There's a chance, even though you've been vaccinated, that you could still catch it. Might not be as bad. Might not even know it. But there's still a chance. Um, with their vaccines, many of them are in series of vaccines, so it takes a while to build that immunity up, over sometimes uh, over a couple years to build that immunity up. You don't have that full protection. And there's so that's why we update things from time to time. We know that we need to get our tetanus updated every 10 years. If you've not had a if you've not had your uh, tetanus updated that has the pertussis additive into there, we're not protecting you from whooping cough, which is very real when you're, especially if you're around young infants that have just been born. That's one of the things they make sure you've gotten that, uh, that you've had a, had that tetanus update with pertussis in it. So there is still a chance that you can catch. Most it's, people don't get a tetanus shot until they've cut themselves, right? You know, that I'm working on a project around yeah. the house and then you go to the emergency room or whatever. And when's your last tetanus shot? I don't know. No clue. <laughs> So I'm getting it then, right? I mean, most You're people don't really do it on a every 10-year basis, right? And Is there's it? a reason that healthcare provider is saying we need to update your okay. tetanus. If I don't know, it's not just for the commission. Not for the commission. No. <laughs> if I don't know, is it cool? You know, like, look, I it may have been within the last 10 years. I don't know. Does it matter if it's only been four or five, six? Just we should probably go ahead and do it anyway yeah, the and, doctor might say or and that's why it's good to keep a good shot record um the health department <laughs> keeps them on all the people back as far away before i was ever born of yeah. uh, vaccines that received at the health department now if you're getting them from your primary care doctor maybe maryland and virginia um, we don't have records of right. those um, we do have a statewide database that um, west virginia cis is what it's called and um, it keeps track of immunizations up to and including your covid vaccines so when you come in the health department you're getting your shots we're going to we're going to give you a shot record but we're also uploading all that information to our state database bill wasn't there also a, a an attempt at some type of legislation at a database to track side effects as well in west virginia well there there are there there is a date i mean we have to report any adverse reactions that anyone would have from vaccines that has to get reported now and if i'm not mistaken that also goes to cdc that's federal but there's yes. nothing statewide that tracks that well we of. submit those to the state and then we go on to the federal all right you were saying john is there anything you want to see the legislature do during this session that would help your job that would that would help our public health is there i mean is there are there one or two things i'm so glad you asked that question <laughs> well that'll be uh that'll be twelve dollars okay um it's an odd amount of money to say towards 12.41 good towards purchasing your tires um so um one of the biggest things and um i, I talked with senator barrett while we were down there and, and I have to give him a lot of kudos. He and um, Senator Blair have been so instrumental in making sure that health department um, across the state receive salary increases anytime the government, the state government, gives it to state employees because we are not state employees. So they made a they made a, a, a policy that anytime that's given to the the state employees, they give it to the health department as well. We're not forgotten. So thanks, uh, thanks, Jason, if you're watching. Um, and um, so the big thing is, is looking, and I know it's not necessarily popular, but the locality pay. Yes. We ha we struggle with um, uh, pro providing adequate salaries to our staff based on the fact that we have to go by what the West Virginia Division of Personnel sets salaries at. And they look at the same salaries that for someone that's living in Boone County or Calhoun or Wirt, um, Wood, any of those smaller counties than what the same salary structure we utilize here in Berkeley, Morgan, and Jefferson. Well, it's, it's not popular because it's wrong. It's patently wrong what they do to the Eastern Panhandle that pumps more money into the state coffers than any other section of the state. But yet we are not allowed to pay our state workers here a fair wage so they can live, so they can live a good life. Go on. I didn't mean to interrupt you. But no, that just, no. Preach that it. That angers Preach me. it. <laughs> I, get, I get angry by that. I get angry by teachers leaving. I get angry by our state workers be not being paid enough. You can buy a house in Boone County for sixty five, seventy thousand dollars. Mm -hmm. You go down to Welsh, heck they'll hand you a house. Mm -hmm. Up here, you know, you're two hundred fifty, three hundred thousand and it's ridiculous. Sorry, go on. It's ridiculous that our state workers up here cannot be paid a fair wage. Our, that, one of the reasons that DHHR has a hard problem having case managers, social workers, um, workers at, 
event all sorts at, at DHHR, but also at the health department. When we, especially when you look at what some of the uh, the requirements are for a position that we have at the health department, they may require to have a a, a bachelor bachelor's degree. And if you've not been in the system, you're going to start off about thirty thousand dollars for someone that's required how much debt that you had to incur to get that bachelor degree, and we're going to start you off at that. You can go over to Sheets and make a little more than that, and they'll you give can. you a free sub every uh, every every shift, I think. So we so we are really fighting for that locality pay or, or salary adjustment pay, whatever you want to have for the Eastern Panhandle, because we are struggling. We, we, Berkeley County is growing leaps and bounds every year, the fastest growing county since I can't even remember when, and I've been in public health for 30 years almost, and fastest growing. We have more people coming into our county, and we don't have the staff your health department, any of your state agencies and police departments and all, we don't have enough staff to handle the people we're coming in. So we struggle with getting those higher pays, but along with that has to come additional state revenue. Um, we take care, lots of people think that the health department is under the county, that if we go run short on money, um, that we would um, work with the county and get our budget increased. Well, we pr we get money from the county each year, um, but we're not a county agency. So we maintain the checkbook and the budget and everything at the health department. So we have to get additional state aid. If we get things passed that we can pay our employees higher salaries, we have to have the funding to be able to support that. So the rules that you have to follow are not county rules, they're state rules. Correct. Okay. Bill, we are almost out of time. Final word from you, sir. Hey, I, I just want to, again, um, uh, Mr. Hornby, Mr. Height, um, Jason Barrett, and, and, and Charlie Trump, and Craig, I appreciate all of our legislators that are batting for us here in the Eastern Panhandle. Hey, a real quick question for you before you go, Bill. You mentioned in regards to harm reduction and the uh, reduction of disease in the community with the needle exchange program. Uh, are, are those measurable results that you can point to? Um, absolutely. I mean, we keep track of um, all of our um, syringes that we receive and disperse at the health department, yet provided monthly at our board meetings. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. 832. And by the way, John Bodwell, the average price, according to Zillow, of a home in Boone County sold in the past year was $85,000. I was uh, I was a little off. I forgot to account for the inflation of Joe Biden's America. <laughs>